we can get started at least with some introductions. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Amanda O'Connor and I'm the business development manager for NB5 Geospatial Software, the NB developers. I'm the technical committee chair for the GSIS, the Geoscience Spaceborne Imaging Spectroscopy Committee, technical committee uh, within GRSS. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Ray Coakley from the US Geological Survey. He's a spectroscopic expert. Ray has investigated many, many areas of imaging spectroscopy from mineralogy, biochemical processes, understanding disaster impacts with the uh, deep, water, um, deep horizon spill, analyzing post-fire surface impacts, and he's also contributed immensely to the calibration and validation community for hyperspectral instruments. Uh, Ray is in the process of creating a working group within the GSIS, uh, Jesus Technical Committee as well. Um, I will put a link uh, to the G Jesus Committee in the chat, as well as my email, if you have any questions or want to talk about joining. Um, and I will, we will be um, putting a link up for the commit, the working group that Ray will be developing for studying mineral analysis and mineral spectroscopy that he will be presenting and talking about today. So with that, I will turn it over to Ray. We'll be monitoring the chat. And um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will get to them. Take it away, Ray. Thank you, Amanda. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah. I had the opportunity to work on a lot of different aspects of imaging spectroscopy, but really in the last 15 years, USGS has really brought me more into the surface mineral composition uh, applications. And uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, show um, some of my recent work and talk about recent advancements in, in surface uh, mineral composition sensing, uh, but also kind of uh, lay the groundwork for people to understand the kinds of things this working group would do and give, offer you the opportunity to join it uh, and, and bring your science to bear and work collaboratively. So what I'll show is, is, a, is a large uh, body of work done by quite a few people, um, both within the USGS, in particular I'll call out Bernard Hubbard, my co-lead on, on a few projects in the USGS, and Todd Hafen, who works with me at the USGS Denver Spectroscopy and Lab in in Denver and uh, is also one of the, the leads on the, the spectral library that somewhere of you may be aware of uh, that we put out. And then a lot of partners in NASA that have contributed to this and also partners in Germany at GFZ um, we've worked closely with for mineral sensing. So the, the things I want to kind of touch on this uh, s seminar here is uh, just to list some of the recent advances in remote sensing. I'm sure many of you are aware of them, engaged with them. And then really um, the running theme will be kind of the recurring challenges uh, to mineral identification with, with remote sensing, in particular imaging spectroscopy. And then, as I mentioned with this working group, what can we do to, to further improve our ability to derive mineral information and, and geologic understanding out of these, uh, these new data and uh, new algorithms? And all of this really is going to be illustrated with the uh, USGS work I'm doing, both with existing data, um, new spaceborne data, and then a very new large acquisition of imaging spectrometer data in the Southwest US from airborne platforms. So just uh, here, a list of some of the recent advances. This isn't comprehensive, but I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with the fact that now imaging spectroscopy isn't just a few sensors flown on you know, aircraft, but we now have the launch of quite a few imaging spectrometers that are spaceborne, DSIS, PRISMA, NMAP, EMIT, HISWI, uh, AHSI, and I'm sure I'm, I'm missing some others that I haven't worked with yet. But all of these have um, capability to contribute to our remote sensing of Earth materials. And over the last decade, sensor characteristics have greatly improved, um, again, partly in the expansion of the availability of sensors and data have kind of pushed this. More people that look at the data, the more need there is to, to push the technology to answer questions that haven't been asked before. Um, in particular, I'll point out, you know, these sensors have gone to finer spectral sampling. So for instance, DSIS can have very, can be used with its very fine 
uh, spectral sampling in the visible near infrared on the order of uh, two and a half, uh, could be a little bit off on that, but just generically two and a half nanometer sampling interval and band pass, which is amazing, especially for sensing of rare earth uh, elements and uh, their very fine spectral structure they have in the visible region. But also we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, from airborne platforms, we're seeing spatial samplings where you can fly them, where you can get, you know, less than a meter. Or even if you operate them on a, on a tripod, you could get centimeter scale uh, sampling of an outcrop or, or a mine waste, uh, say mine piles or things like that. Uh, what else uh, do I see as recent advances in remote sensing? Well, all of this, you know, availability of data is pushing countries and uh, organizations to do larger airborne campaigns to collect uh, finer scale data so they can then validate the satellite data. And I'll point out the, the USGS GEMX campaign, Geological Earth Mapping Experiment. That's the one I'm involved on where we're doing the large collections in Southwest US. But also there have been recent AVERS campaigns in Europe and India. And then I believe there's another one planned for India. Uh, DLR has ha operated their airborne sensors uh, over a lot of different parts of the, of the world. Uh, and then kind of accompanying the, this availability of data, we have a uh, more widespread application of what I would call proven methods, things like spectral feature matching, where you have uh, a purified mineral and you try to find those spectral features in the uh, image data, something like Tetracorder, which is uh, Roger Clark's uh, software system. Roger brought me into the USGS. In the USGS now, we also have a system called MICA, which, which is very similar to Tetracorder, runs an IDL code base, and you can download that and, and use that yourself. Uh, and then also mixture modeling methods have been very widely uh, applied across imaging spectroscopy data of all levels. And of course, many of you are probably involved with um, or aware of uh, testing of newer methods, things that rely on machine learning and other advanced computation. So what, you know, despite all these great advances, there are just some recurring challenges that we all see when we, when we go to approach the um, the data and try to pull the most information out of it. First of all, is we don't always have the best ca characterization of sensor performance, and sometimes we're surprised by differences or discrepancies between what we thought we would see in the data and what it actually produces. And I'll call out the IEEE P4001 group that's working on um, protocols and, and reporting for hyperspectral sensors. And so that's another complementary effort of of IEEE that you might be interested in. Basically, it's it's working towards you know having the ability to look at sensor characteristics and compare apples to apples and not have you know some uh, uh, esoteric or or nuanced uh, characteristic of the band pass of the sensor described for one sensor versus the other, but you actually know that you're getting a, an equitable description of the spectral sensing of the sensors. Um, of course, atmosphere corrections one we all uh, deal with, but there are level two products now from some of these satellite systems that that you know you can run with. They all have their issues. So really, validation of radiance and reflectance products is another um, topic that remains a challenge. Is sometimes you don't have the ability to directly validate these signatures that you're trying to interpret, um, and sometimes you do. Um, with things like RadCalNet and, and other types of uh, automated systems. Um, and then, of course, if you're trying to pull together multiple images over an area that were collected over different times, and re really your challenge is to understand whether the sensor and the processing is reliable and stable over both space and time. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll be addressing all of these topics with some examples of what we're doing for the airborne campaign, because all of these become issues uh, with uh, months-long airborne campaigns. Um, something I won't get into too much, but I'll show examples of our, our interpretation of spectra to identify mineral composition, and, uh, and then also having the validation data for those mineral results. Those are, those are major, major uh, steps in the process. Um, and the validation data requires field samples and it requires expense and, and uh, uh, 
it's it's something where uh, not everybody has the opportunity to do that because they might just have the the capability or the um, the program set up to just analyze the imagery but not have the validation data. So that's where I think this working group could really help is to is to collect validation data over case study areas so that people could test their algorithms and their data sets uh, in these test areas and, and have some understanding of the validity of what they're producing. Uh, infrared imaging spectroscopy is another one I think we're, we're seeing some recent advances that I think we're, you know, uh, kind of 10 to 20 years behind vSphere, that's my opinion, where we have a few infrared imaging spectrometers uh, we don't have widespread uh, use of them and testing of them and, and development. So, but it's very exciting because they sense the fundamental absorptions of the primary rock forming minerals. And of course, that's, that's of great interest when we're doing geologic sensing. And uh, we skip to the next one. We're going to go over these last three points here with what I'm going to present um, and uh, kind of talk about, okay, so what can we do in the future then to capitalize on these advances, meet these challenges, uh, and kind of push forward the spectral sensing of, of Earth materials. Well, number one, I think we can work more collaborative uh, than we are now. And um, I hope this new working group we're forming for the GSIS Technical Committee, uh, Spectroscopic Sensing of Earth Materials is the title, will be uh, an off opportunity for that. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Other things we can do collaboratively is publish and, uh, and test protocols for field and lab measurements. And here I'll call out the IEEE P4005 group, which is doing that for soil spectroscopy. So there's a lot we can learn from what they've put together for geologic remote sensing and, and rock and, and sediment type materials. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think, you know, development of mineral validation sites, things like Cuprite, Nevada, which you might be familiar with, where many of my colleagues worked and collected samples for decades uh, to try to, to develop these validation sites. Uh, more, more sites like that over diverse geology would really help when we want to analyze and utilize uh, space-borne data over, over the large areas. Uh, near and dear to my heart is continuing development of spectral libraries, uh, really expanding the number of pure mineral specimens uh, with over 4,000 minerals um, that, are, that are named. There's certainly, we've just uh, scratched the surface of really understanding those mineral signatures of, of pure minerals. But I think we could do also uh, a continued development of libraries to include whole rock imaging with like drill core scanning systems or laboratory imaging spectrometers uh, with companion analysis. So you can look at the, the signatures that are more like the ones you'll see from the remote sensing level where you have the mixtures and the compositions that, that, uh, that are uh, directly uh, uh, applicable to the remote sensing, you know, five to 30 meter pixel. Something that we want to move forward with at the USGS that, that I'll, I'll show you the kind of data we're collecting that's vSWIR and thermal infrared is the synergy of those two, not just analyzing them separately, but also, you know, what can we do to interpret that all, both wavelength regions collectively simultaneously to understand the mineral composition. And then I think one of the last point I make here on this slide is that what I see we, we have been successful with, with the USGS recently in, in the United States is the making the case for geologic remote sensing, how it is important to the na a nation's economy, to uh, things like critical minerals, and, and what the need is for that geologic remote sensing, and then getting that technology put into space and, and having the data provided. So the, the working group, which I think, you know, uh, some of you, I hope, would have an interest in is the spectroscopic sensing of Earth materials, really looking to draw from a collective uh, community engagement to expand our spectroscopic understanding of rock sediments and soils, and both uh, just from a kind of pure fundamental science standpoint, 
uh, build that knowledge, but also from an application standpoint and how those uh, spectral signatures let us characterize geology, geochemistry, physical and chemical processes, and, and how the geology can also link to, to biological function and the overlying plant community. Uh, so there's several people that step forward uh, to, to be involved with this work. I'm serving as the, I guess you would say, the responsible GSS co-chair for it. The leads are Carlos Souza, uh, University of Campinas, Brazil, Rebecca Greenberger from Caltech, and then also uh, serving as co-leads, Chris Hecker from ITC in the Netherlands and Karsten Laukamp from, from Cicero in, in Australia. So I would invite you all to, to reach out, to keep your eye on uh, to me and to get involved or any of these co-chairs and leads, uh, but also you know keep your eye on the, the uh, GSIS website and see what uh, what uh, activities are going on that you might want to engage with. So getting um, kind of into the, to the meat, more the sciencey part of this, uh, show you my experience, recent experience with uh, trying to utilize these uh, air imaging spectroscopy data for large area surveys of, of uh, surface minerals. Uh, I have a very nice project funded by the USGS Earth Mapping Resources Initiative. It's an effort to modernize the nation's mapping of resources with a particular focus on critical minerals. And in addition to this uh, funding of hyperspectral surveys in the Western United States, which started a few years ago, there's a lot of money being spent on airborne geophysical surveys for knowledge of the subsurface, light, high resolution LIDAR surveys, geochemical sampling and quantification and geologic mapping. So it's a very huge effort in the USGS on the order of $300 million, some of which is, is, is a, what we get to tap in to expand our uh, surface mineral sensing with imaging spectroscopy. Again, I'll mention Bernard Hubbard is my co-lead on that. Uh, and then Todd Hafen, John Meyer, and Evan Cox, also at USGS in Denver, are remote sensing specialists on this. Uh, and you might've seen some of their present Presentations in other venues. John just presented on mapping of lithium bearing smectites at the Clay Mineral Society meeting. And Todd is uh, often at GRSG and, and other geologic remote sensing meetings. So, just a couple, uh, couple comments here on background. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but uh, you, we get a lot of leverage in the visible to shortwave infrared on the mineral composition by looking at key absorption features, knowing their causes in terms of what the bonds are within the mineral structure that are causing these absorption features, not really building that fundamental knowledge and then being able to interpret the, the spectral signatures and the imaging spectrometer data are what allow us to, to be successful at surface mineral sensing. We use a system called uh, MICA, as I mentioned before, to, to do this work. So what EarthMRI has funded is a collection of a large set of new airborne data, building off some existing collections that NASA had done with the AVR sensor. So in yellow here, you can see the uh, legacy data that we're utilizing for USGS project. That's um, parts of California, Nevada. It's about 380,000 square kilometers. And then for Earth MRI, we are building off of that with new airborne collections in this white shaded area. We'll get wall-to-wall -wall mapping through there. And then as much as we can in the dark shaded areas. So the collection started in 2023 uh, in the primary area. And in 2023, we were able to cover a good area of ground, 172,000 square kilometers from the NASA ER2, which operates at 65,000 feet. And this was uh, Avers Classic data for this area, which covers as a visible to shortwave infrared, and Master data, which covers uh, short visible shortwave infrared with 25 channels, so multispectral sensor, but it has 15 channels in the midwave infrared and 10 channels in the in the thermal infrared. So those, uh, those data of, uh, collections were continued here in 2024. We started April 3rd. Um, they're ongoing. This is our last week. So I might sound a little tired or uh, my voice might be a little off because it's been a lot of long days, early mornings to, to do the flight planning and check the weather and, and get these flights done. 
but it has been incredibly successful. We have 368,000 kilometers, uh, square kilometers collected. And you can see we got pretty much complete collection of all of Southern Arizona. Uh, and, and we did complete collection of all of California. So if we look at 2023 and 2024, we build those together. You can see quite an amazing collection. And then when we add in that archive data, now we're really talking 808,000 square kilometers, 2.8 billion spectra, lots of work for, for scientists. So this data is publicly available. Uh, it's level one radiance and level two reflectance is, is put out as quickly as they can process it from JPL. Uh, on their Avris website. MASTER also puts their data out through the um, uh, NASA DAC uh, data center. Uh, and so these are all publicly available. Uh, I will say that we're, do, we're gonna do some extra processing on the USGS side, and I'll talk about that a little later, to further refine the reflectance. And, and we plan to put out a ground calibrated reflectance product and, and mineral maps derived from that. Uh, so that's all forthcoming. But these data are, you know, as soon as they can be made publicly available, available for people to utilize. And, and you can see because we're spanning such a large area, we, we are going to cover a lot of deposit types. We're going to cover diverse geology, surface composition. It's, it's quite an amazing data set. So if we, we look at some of the highlights here, we have complete coverage of the San Andreas fault system in the United States. Uh, complete coverage of California, which is, we've been aiming for that for a long time. Uh, and uh, yeah, so hopefully some of you can utilize this data or in, at least to find analogs for uh, areas that you're interested in, in, in your particular studies that may fall in, in this cover coverage and, and pull these data and look at them. I'll mention that we're, we're likely binning the average data to 15 meter grid spacing in our final products, and then the master data is at 50 meter, five zero meter resolution. Still have, you know, a couple days left uh, to pick up these last uh, collection areas that we had planned in New Mexico. Unfortunately, the weather's not looking so good, so we probably won't, we won't get that. Um, Complementary to, to this large airborne coverage, we are looking at uh, district scale surveys. So these are finer uh, spatial resolution surveys over smaller areas. We were very lucky that NASA flew their Avaris 3 sensor. So this is kind of getting to these advances. Uh, Avaris has evolved from Avaris Classic to Avaris NG, Avaris 3, Avaris 4 is, is similar to Avaris 3, but it's operated by uh, University of Zurich and, and Andy Huney and, and the group there. And it's under development uh, for, for operational use. Uh, I believe it it's flying, it's been integrated and hopefully flying, collecting uh, first science data soon. Um, but Avers 3, uh, they flew some targets for us in Arizona and New Mexico with the focus on mine waste and recovery of critical minerals from mine waste. Uh, so you can see those flight strips there in the green and then even lower altitude, finer resolution data in those little blue strips. And on the left here is an example of uh, just a false color image. It's incredible spatial quality of the data. Uh, and we're really looking forward to, to working with these data in the future. Uh, another aspect of what we're doing with Earth MRI is commercial contracting. So these shaded uh, black outline boxes here are areas where we, we hope to try to get uh, additional commercial data collects uh, to accompany these data. And so we're working through the, the USGS contracting process for that. But we have flown other areas, again, with a focus on mine waste and critical minerals from mine waste. Uh, and we flew parts of Florida, which, as you can imagine, quite a challenge with all the uh, cloud cover. But this was done in 2023 in the fall. Uh, Ace of Phoenix 1K sensor was flown. And then the Mako thermal infrared uh, imaging spectrometer was flown as well. So this is going to be great data to, to have available to the community to, to analyze ourselves. The MAKO data in particular are, I don't believe, very widely utilized yet because uh, they're, they're usually flown for applications that the data is not shared. 
but in our case examples here, both in Florida for, for phosphogypsum uh, stacks and, and then in Puerto Rico, where we did an additional collection with MAKO, we're going to be able to provide these data to the, to the public. So you can you know, look at the quality of the data and look at the types of signatures that are uh, expressed in those data in these areas. In Puerto Rico, these flights were done in the in the green shaded box, green colored boxes here for uh, both industrial mineral production, but uh, or exploration and uh, post hurricane landslide hazards. My colleague Bernard Hubbard's leading these uh, fine resolution commercial collects, uh, so I can connect you with him if you have more questions about these data. Um, but we were Bernard and I work very closely together in both the regional and the and the uh, district scale collections. You see, we got uh, a little more expanded coverage with MAKO along the southwest uh, coast of Puerto Rico as well. So pretty nice coverage with, with MAKO. Again, I, I'm really looking forward to, to looking at these, these cutting edge data. So I, I had mentioned, uh, you know, we're gonna leverage up the quality of, of all these imaging spectrometer data sets in terms of the reflectance retrievals using ground calibration. So as part of the earth MRI process, and, and maybe this is some familiar uh, to some of you and your work, we, we make measurements of specific areas on the ground that we then uh, characterize with our ASD spectrometer. We walk three or four hours, sometimes five hours for the larger sites over an area, cover anywhere from three and a half to, to uh, six miles of walking these sites to, to try to build up representative sampling and get an average signature from the ASD that we can use to validate the airborne or the spaceborne imaging spectrometer data. But also if necessary, we can make empirical adjustments to those reflective products in order to pull the most mineral information we can out of the data and just reduce any of those atmospheric residuals. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through a lot of the uh, things I had alluded to in those first two slides here with some examples for Cooperite Nevada. So for Cooperite Nevada, which is one of these ground, has one of these ground calibration sites and is a mineral validation site, we have decades of, of work there with uh, sample collections that have been characterized and published in our spectral library. And a lot of people have used Cooperite as a geologic remote sensing test. Bed. And we're also looking to, as I mentioned, develop more. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show some evaluations of level two reflectance products from uh, Emit, Nmap, Prisma, Hisui, um, and uh, a couple of airborne sensors, uh, and uh, talk about you know what those evaluations reveal about the sensor and the ability to re retrieve mineral information from those data. First thing we do. Um, uh, is sort of understand the different sensor, sensor characteristics. So here we've got um, three first lines here, our, our airborne sensors, Averse NG, Averse Classic, which is a whisk room sensor. So no it, real issues with cross uh, track spectral uniformity. Uh, and then we get into the spaceborne sensors, which are all push broom sensors, His, Hisui, Nmap, Prisma, Galfin 5, or AHSI on Galfin 5, and EMIT. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the AHSI data uh, analyzed yet. We're working on it, but that's in progress. But for all these other, you can see that they have different spatial characteristics, different spectral characteristics, different atmospheric corrections applied. So it's going to be interesting to compare them uh, across a, a field site where we have good ground validation. First thing we did in looking at these data, and, and I'm sure it's something you do, is, is try to assess how good the geocoding is. Uh, are the pixels falling where they should? In particular, if you're trying to compare or, or, or collect field data, you want to know how well this, uh, this uh, geometric correction is and if necessary, refine it. What we found for these different sets were they range from you know, sub-pixel, um, accuracies uh, compared to our, our ground control points, uh, which we had, I, I believe, about 100 per image that we, we used to evaluate the, and if necessary, refine the geocoding. 
um, to, to some larger um, errors in terms of number of pixels, but also, um, you know, meters of, of inaccuracy. But when we selected ground control points and warped those, you can see here in the last column, all of those uh, really came to sub-pixel uh, levels of error where, where you can then, uh, then work with the data relative and to your uh, field sampling plans and to your, uh, say, existing field collections or, or sampled uh, rocks and, and have some idea of how, how, how far off your locations may be between your sample and your image pixels. So I, I mentioned uh, also, you know, one of the challenges is assessing or understanding your reflectance data. So here I'm showing the reflectance measurements we made at uh, Stonewell Playa on Cuprite for, e or Blackrock Playa, sorry, for emit in the red line and uh, the ASD measurement in the black line. This is for really large site, 240 meters by 240 meters. And you can see, we see a lot of great agreement generally within uh, the uncertainties described for emit. But we also can key in on some little differences uh, that are um, discrepancies that we might want to refine because they might impact our interpretation of these, of these data. Uh, so one thing in particular we've noted in a lot of emit data is this artifact at 2.108 microns, which for mineral sensing is, is not a huge impact, but for other types of applications, say, um, characterization of crop residue or non-photosynthetic vegetation, that absorption feature falls right in that area. But what we see with emit is that generally there, there's some, uh, some small artifacts that, that can impact the mineral sensing, but generally across the board, it's, it's pretty darn good. Similar observations for NMAP data collected over the same playa. There's a few expected residuals with the uh, CO2 and the shortwave infrared, but generally we have good recovery of the shape, spectral shape. And then what we do see in emit and pretty much all um, ModTran-based corrections like uh, at core four here, which is applied to NMAP, we do see these jiggy jaggy little residuals at the 2.3 to 2.5 micron region. And depending on the magnitude of those residuals and the strength of the absorptions of the minerals in the rocks and the areas we're imaging, those could be impactful. They could prevent us from seeing what we want to see. So in order to uh, resolve that, we, we top, typically look at both uh, that reflectance product that's produced by the atmosphere correction. So we'd call that a level two or a level two A reflectance product. And we try to interpret the mineral composition out of that. But then we also further empirically force those, those residuals to go away. Um, what we call radiative transfer ground calibrated data or RTGC data. And then we look at the mineral results for that. And by comparing those two images on the bottom, the left being the level two reflectance, the right being the, the ground calibrated reflectance, we can get an understanding of, well, how, how much are those residuals affecting our ability to determine the mineral composition? So this is the mineral map for cuprite Nevada, this is from Avarice Classic in the top right, the ground calibrated image. Here's the calibration site shown with this white square. And I'm sure you're familiar with Greg Swayze's work and his publication in Economic Geology, which really showed how, how these minerals are distributed through two hydrothermal alteration centers, one in the east, uh, which has a, a silicic hydrated silica cap on it, and one that's more deeply exposed in, in on the Western side here, uh, where you have a lot of expression of alunites and various uh, compositions of alunites. So this, um, what we're looking for in these images, and when we're looking at imaging spectrometer data, uh, both airborne and spaceborne, which I'm going to show, is we're really looking to see how well does the, the minerals in the bottom images align with this one in the top right? How are these distributions? Similar in space, are the I know are the mineral identifications the same? In other words, are these colors the same? And and does that also work um, 
and can be consistent between the level two product and the ground calibrated product. And that tells us uh, how those residuals uh, discrepancies in, in the level two product may be affecting our mineral mapping. So here we see we, we've got great correspondence uh, in all levels. If we look at NMAP data, which is 30 meter pixel size, uh, we can see there's still really good agreement. So let me focus on the right column here with the Aris on the top and the NMAP on the bottom. We have great uh, agreement in what's being mapped and their distributions. A little less sensitivity to some minerals. So you can see there's less of this uh, darker red uh, color that indicates the distribution of chloride. And we have some differences when we look from the level two product to the ground calibrator product in these green pixels distributed in, in these areas in the northeast uh, that, that are identified as calcite in the NMAP level two product, but not in the ground calibrated. And again, this speaks to those little residuals at 2.3 microns and longer, which, which affect our ability to detect calcite reliably or can affect it depending on how you have your analysis structured. So in this case, we see we we do see that that is an impact when we if we try to directly look at only the level two data. So we need to be aware of that when we try to interpret this image. Moving to coarser spatial resolution, let's look at emit here. Emit is 60 meter spatial size. And so we see, again, similar patterns, but we start to see this effect of spatial resolution come into play uh, where these patterns are just not as well defined in the emit data as they are in the average data, but still generally good agreement in the classes of minerals that are detected. detected. Again, when we look at level two on the bottom left versus ground calibrated on the bottom right, we see this area here in the Northwest, we get some shift in what was identified as uh, calcite containing areas versus uh, when you go to the ground, there's, there's no uh, strong calcite signature there. So again, a theme, a theme here and something we've observed in a lot of uh, modtran based correction of data. Looking at Prisma, we, we can see here's an example where we have a, a very large discrepancy in the level two uh, reflectance product and the minerals derived from it versus our benchmark data or our case study data. Uh, and this, I, I saw a large residual in the spectra near 2.14 microns, and that's causing a lot of these minerals to bend into budding tonight. So, so again, having this case study data, the validation data of the minerals uh, that occur in this area lets us then know there's a problem with the level two product. And having the calibration data for Stonewall Playa lets us adjust those data and see well they perform after we try to remove those residuals. And we can see it does pretty well. I will say that uh, these distributions uh, turned out to be surprisingly good match to the, to the airborne benchmark data. But you can see uh, as we get to the western side here, we got to get a lot more striping in there. And, and, and my attribution, I haven't discussed this yet with the Prisma team, is that there's just some um, uncertain knowledge about the cross-track uniformity, either the radiometric or spectral uh, uniformity that, that may be then causing these mineral identifications to start to deteriorate as you get to different parts of the detector array. So I got a few more thoughts uh, before we open it up for discussion. One thing I wanted to, to mention, um, we, we, depending on your application, you could be using different parts of the spectrum more often than others. If you're using uh, some region of the spectrum more than others, then that's really, in my opinion, the place to focus on improving those level two reflectance products. So here I have a plot of how we're using the channels in uh, Avaris imaging spectrometer data to, to map microns with absorption features in the one to two and a half micron range. You can see we're really heavily utilizing absorption features around 2.2 microns, things that are common to uh, montmorillonites and uh, white micas and, and other clays. Um, but we pretty heavily used from 2.1 to 2.4 those channels. Uh, so that red line kind of shows that, that usage of the channels here. Um, and then in the gray lines, you can see regions that are typically affected by 
um, atmospheric residuals. So that 2.3 to 2.5 micron region, as I mentioned, is important for identifying a lot of a lot of minerals. Um, there's also uh, 1.7 to 1.8, which we find very important for identifying sulfates, gypsum, and alunite. And then additional features near absorption, water vapor absorption features at 1.45 to 1.5 that are also important to 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 try to resolve. Um, so these are, I say, problem areas for a lot of re level two reflectance data challenges that we need to overcome to order in order to uh, either have our algorithm, algorithms working correctly or, or to adjust our data to, to produce better data. And if we do so, we're going to get better mineral mapping. The last thing I want to mention kind of on that theme is some of the work we're doing, uh, or at least the last thing with these data, is the work we're doing with uh, California Geological Survey and looking at lithium resources in the Barstow, Barstow Formation. In particular, we're using um, the lithium bearing smectite, uh, hectorite, as, as kind of our pathfinder here to understanding more about lithium resources. Uh, and this has an absorption feature near 2.3 microns. So this is why the, that proving data in those regions really is important to us uh, so that we can be able to properly interpret those imaging spectrometer data that we're collecting across the Western US in order to, to, to contribute to understanding of this resource. Other work I wanna mention that the group has put out recently is, is trying to separate hydrothermal Sericite versus other white micas, and this is work in the Battle Mountain District done, uh, led by John Meyer and our group. Uh, and this is using that airborne data that was archived uh, by NASA uh, in the, the kind of uh, yellow shaded area that I mentioned before on those maps. So final thoughts. Um, you saw examples of, of how we're using uh, good knowledge of a uh, case study site, Cuprite, Nevada, to look at imaging spectrometer data, both airborne and spaceborne data, and evaluate how well it's performing, understand what um, confusions might be in, in the level two data interpretations versus uh, ground calibrated data. Um, and so I think this these are good examples that we need across the globe uh, for different field sites. Uh, more diverse geology. When I look at EMIT data, I know EMIT, some of you may be familiar with this. EMIT is producing mineral identifications across the globe in order to understand the contribution of, of, of uh, dust source regions to radiative forcing, right? So there's a suite of minerals that they're trying to, to, to sense accurately. And there's it's only 10 minerals, but they're also producing mineral maps for uh, you know, another 40 to 50 minerals and then 150 mineral mixtures. So uh, while I have great ground control at Cooperite Nevada, when we try to evaluate those mineral products over the globe, or at least over the dust producing regions of the world, for MIT, it's a much bigger challenge and something that I think uh, this group uh, and IEEE could contribute to. So uh, with that, I'll thank you for your attention and then uh, just leave this slide up here uh, for the working group and how you can get involved. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Amanda. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Ray. Appreciate the presentation. That was excellent. Um, I always get jealous of seeing all your field work uh, pictures and then I remember what field work is, was like. Um, <laughs> So um, kudos for you for getting out there. Um, we have a couple of questions, I guess. Um, I did want to start first. Um, you, you mentioned the, the working group. Um, you know, what are some of your higher goals with that in terms of you, know, you brought some incredible people together, um, you know, better understand spectroscopy and rocks and sediments. Are you looking to um, you know, it just expand that knowledge to a wider audience or just kind of bring more meeting of the minds together? Yeah, I think it would be um, at first start to bring people together 
to listen to what they see are the, the, the major challenges to applying imaging spectrometer or, or multispectral data to spectral sensing. So kind of just lay out what the biggest uh, barriers are. And these are a lot of experts. So our barriers are going to be different than someone who's approaching this from, you know, just a new, new user standpoint. So I think that kind of listening session at the beginning is going to be huge. And that's where I think we can involve everybody, be you a uh, graduate student that's just starting out in this or someone that's in a, a geo that has never used hyperspectral. So I think that's that's our one of our first tasks uh, is to do that uh, kind of listening and understand uh, how we can come up with, say, lists of software or um, uh, how do you acquire data, these kinds of things that just enable a lot of people. But then I also hope that we can dig in deeper uh, to some of these things I mentioned, like, okay, we want to try to find lithium bearing smectite or some other interesting mineral that has spectrally similar uh, uh, minerals that might uh, interfere with that. And so kind of these, I would call them spectral mysteries. How do we uh, investigate these spectral mysteries and come up with methods to or algorithms to to identify specific mineral versus all the other spectral similar minerals uh yeah so does that answer your question yes yes thank you and, and really we want it we want people to be involved so it's going to evolve these are just you know my thoughts but uh, uh we'll hear more and we'll have uh the leads and co-leads uh make presentations as well very good um, one, just a comment, um, my email is in the chat and I also put a link to, um, Prism, uh, the software that Ray and crew have, have developed for mineral mapping, um, cause I had a few questions, um, uh, regarding, uh, mineral mapping techniques. Um, there are actually a few, quite a few questions, so I'm trying to kind of sort through, um, let's see, um, Oh, here's one from your, your from Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Um, Carrie Middleton asks, it'd be good to, or base or comments, it'd be good to consider a collaborative effort to ensure the growth and permanence of the spectral library, either SPI, IEEE, others that may have interest. Um, I don't know whether that would fall under um, IEEE standards, but that might be something we should talk to the standards group about. Yeah, definitely. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a P4005 group that's trying to define, you know, both protocols and but also data standards for spectral libraries for soils. So that's something we can definitely kind of tail on to or, or add, you know, use use in our efforts. Yeah, the spectral libraries, I think that's huge. Yeah, enjoy, ensuring the longevity of spectral libraries is important uh, to me. We have a lot of challenges in the USGS with our website delivery and uh, changes for secure IT security that really, and, and I apologize if you've been frustrated by it, sometimes can take our spectral library down for uh, hours to weeks, you know, so we do need a better, a better solution, something that, that may be, you know, uh, it's supported by a, by a larger organization. So uh, that's a great suggestion. And, and we'll have to look into that, Amanda, as to is that something IEEE does or, or mm -hmm. maybe one of these other venues is the proper way to do that? Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. So we'll, we'll engage with that team. There was a question about the standard. Um, how can we ensure the reliability and stability of sensor performance over time and across different geographical regions, particularly in the context of the IEEE P4001 standard? Yeah, that is a huge question and something that, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, you saw we've, we've been to 60 or so, evaluated 60 or so ground calibration sites across the Western US. That's because, you know, our experience in the USGS over the last 30, to 40 years of imaging spectroscopy is that, you know, sometimes you need that initial leverage to really pull the most out of your data, but often you need it just to understand, is your sensor stable from flight line one to flight line two in a day? 
which sometimes they're not, or, or from day one to day two or throughout a 30-day campaign or from launch to two years past launch. Um, so I think that's something that this group could really discuss. And I, and I think what I was trying to show with that group right example is we have field measurements of reflectance for one of those sites. We can very well calibrate airborne data or good spaceborne data for that and reveal the mineral signatures within that localized region. Depending on the atmospheric conditions, that could be within 20 kilometers of that ground site, or it could be hold up even more, um, 50 to 100 kilometers. But then once you have that validated image and those mineral signatures, um, then you have things that you can, you have something you can compare other data too. So that's the way I envision using these uh, GEMX data is that we will have ground calibrated, very um, good reflectance data that then we can compare to airborne data. Now that works great where the, the ground is relatively bare, where there's not a lot of change. Fortunately, in the Western US, we have quite a lot of that. So that's what I could see as a, as a way forward is like this collective group effort could look to say develop a number of these kinds of uh, airborne data sets as the benchmark data set um, to which we can compare other sensors to. So it's kind of, a I guess, a little more ad hoc or, or user developed versus things like RadCalNet, where there are a few sites around the world where they are using radiometers to measure the signatures, but they're very, um, you know, they're very few. I, I can't remember what the number is, five to 10 at most around the world. And they're really localized to one particular part of a playa. They don't show you the spectral signatures across a 10 to 40 kilometer area, for example. So that's a great question. And, and if you can get, whoever asked that, if they can get involved with uh, the, the calibration validation teams on any of those imaging spectrometers that are in space, that I mentioned either as a contributor, that's how I'm contributing to NMAP. I'm just doing activities that I know can contribute to um, validating NMAP. I'm just providing them data and data to the public to do those validations. So that's that's something I would, I would say. If, if you have a good access to the field and you have your site that you can get to, that's something that could be offered up and by connecting to these spaceborne missions. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. That, uh, that was a great answer. And yeah, I would encourage you to look around the GRSS uh, website. Um, I think there's uh, various teams that might might be interested, you might be interested in working with and, um, and talking with. Um, a question from Jenny Bloom. Um, do you have any suggestions on what should be studied to really help improve um, mineral identification, um, geologic science, like how do you really get into this as a student? Like, how did you start? I mean, I started <laughs> as a volunteer, so I was not paid for my time. <laughs> <laughs> so I started volunteering at the USGS under Roger Clark, who's a planetary, was a planetary scientist at the USGS now at uh, PSI. Um, yeah, so I just took the area that I was interested in, which was uh, plant biochemistry, and try to develop an analog to this mineral chemistry and mineral interpretation. So my first step was understanding the chemical, physical composition of whatever material I was interested in, in characterizing or mapping. So I'd say that's one of the first things is develop that you know fundamental knowledge. And then the second step was to work with experts like Roger and others or Alex Getz at, at C Boulder. And they had some spectral libraries and start understanding, okay, these uh, materials that I'm interested in, what do we know about their spectral signatures? And then trying to understand, um, say for a particular set of plants, uh, plant conifers, for example, you know, how do those differ amongst the conifers? And then how does that relate to their physical canopy structure, or their chemical structure? So minerals, same thing. If you have a particular study area, I would comb through the literature to see who's worked in those kinds of deposits or those kinds of geologic contexts. 
and then try to find those spectral libraries that, that would show you what those signatures are that you should find. Fortunately, today we have a lot of available spectral libraries. Um, we also have a lot of available spectral data. So I think um, not all of those spaceborne missions have the data fully open, but I know Nmap, Emit, Prisma. I think you can you can get onto their data uh, provision site. Um, so there's a lot of data sources out there for for you. Um, yeah, and be involved with this working group. I think that's uh, that's uh, what I would, what I would recommend. You're going to hear from a lot of experts uh, that worked in a lot of different areas, and uh, you're going to be able to pose your questions and uh, all those you know anything that relates to going from ground zero to working with spectroscopy up to being an expert. Um, the people involved with this working group they were there at the very beginning. A lot of them, so they had the same questions that you have. When you're thinking, well, I just want to look for uh, my particular mineral in my area. That's kind of how we all started. So I think this, that's why I love this work, the idea of this working group. I wish we had the website up and running already. Um, but, but we're look, look for the GSIS website uh, to see the advertisement of this working group and all our activities and, and we'll, we'll help you get going. This regard to working groups within um, Jesus, you you don't have to be a member. Um, you can even propose a working group of your own. So, you know, Ray's sponsoring this one because this is an area of interest to him. But if you have an area of interest for hyperspectral remote sensing and you think that you have some people you want to bring together and have some resources available to you from um, GRSS, um, there are proposals that are offered um, that's certainly possible. So uh, I would just say, reach out to me and we can, we can see about setting one up. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a very open community. I mean, our goal is to really expand, uh, the use of hyperspectral data, the understanding of it. And, you know, we picked an area of mineral, you know, mineralogy as a starting point, but that doesn't have to be the only place that we're really focusing. Um, we're almost out of time. I think we're one more minute. Um, I, I'll sneak in one from Lori Wickert. And then for those of you who I didn't get to your questions, again, um, I will type my email here and uh, please just reach out and I will get back to you um, or I'll get back with Ray. Um, Lori asked, how can we use information from local calibrations of data such as Inmap, Inmap at Coopright to make systemic Corrections to the broad, okay. Corrections to the broad correction of the full collection of in-map data globally. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a great question. Something that um, I mean, you saw why we, why we have those sixty sites is we're trying to to come up with say a, uh, a a more systematic correction for all that average data we're flying that then we can get closer to the, the true spectral signatures that, that the radiative transfer data doesn't get us to. Um, so it, it, I'd say, Lori, it just depends on how consistent that sensor is and how consistent the processing is. If over these 60 sites, we see the same adjustments can be made and produce the good quality data we want, then, then we're going to be in great shape. If we see from site to site when we take our field measurements and compare them to the imaging spectrometer data, that those corrections we need are vary from site to site, then we know we've got a bigger problem, and, and we've got to work with the calibration validation teams of the sensor to to improve their understanding and, and processing of the data. But if we're lucky, we see the same consist inconsistencies, and we can have a, a wholesale correction that helps remove those. Great, thanks. Well, we will wrap up. I uh, appreciate everybody's attendance and um, interest in this. We, there were a lot of questions, so. Um, well, that, yeah, that's good. So join the yeah. working group and, and we can just have a discussion about these. Exactly, than, uh, exactly, more, that's more the best thing. Um, unfortunately, Ray and I won't be at IGARS, uh, but we're around, um, hope to hear from some of you. And uh, thanks Haley for organizing these webinars. Um, she always does a great job in getting us all set. So have a wonderful day and we'll see you soon. Thanks everyone.